across the network. Okay, so John and I are here today to talk to you about reactive programming at scale. Now, to give you uh, some sense of the scale which we operate, I want to give you some background on our, on our industry. So in our business, there are two key stakeholders, the publisher and the advertiser, and our job is to connect them as efficiently as possible. Now, most of you will be familiar with traditional media and how it works. Uh, you have a publisher who might have some space available. They go to an advertiser and say, OK, we've got this space available. And the advertiser says, well, does this target our core demographic? And if it does, they consider buying it. And a significant portion of digital media is traded in a similar way. However, things have started to change in, in this industry. We're moving more and more towards online exchanges where media is traded. And in this type of scenario, you have publishers who aggregate all their inventory. And via what's called a sell side platform, they solicit bids from advertisers through an exchange. The advertiser, then using what's called the demand side platform, bids on every single impression in real time. So if we were to look at the ad cycle and how it works, if you go to a web page and you click on a website, what happens is the publisher sends information about you and the site, etc., into the exchange. The exchange then solicits bids from all the different DSPs. DSP has to make a decision. Now, a DSP could represent hundreds of advertisers and thousands of campaigns. It's got to work out how much should it bid for this particular slot and what type of creative or ad it should show. So a lot of optimization algorithms have to run. Once it's actually submitted a bid, it enters into an auction. Whoever wins the auction serves the ad. Thing is, people don't like waiting for their web pages to load. So this whole process needs to happen in about 100 milliseconds, so extremely short latency. But on top of that, it happens about 20 billion plus times a day, and significantly more if we had in video. This is just dealing with display. So what type of system would you need to build to support something like this? Well, obviously, you need something that's responsive. If we don't hit that 100 millisecond SLA, we don't enter the auction, our ads don't get served. We need to be able to scale, but also scale elastically, because those 20 billion plus requests don't come in uniformly throughout the day. There are peaks and there are troughs. We need to be resilient. Again, if we don't serve our ads, we don't get paid. And finally, as you can imagine, we process a huge amount of data. We get 20 billion plus bid requests. We get all this data generated as a result so we can make good decisions on what types of ads to serve. The traditional cry of the marketing manager is, I know I waste half my advertising budget, but I don't know which half. The great thing in the digital world is we have information on what type of bids we're making, what ads are being served, who's clicking on them, who's viewing them, etc. So how would you build a system like this? Well, the first thing is you need a serious amount of processing power. But the thing is, modern processors require us to parallelize our efforts. If you look here at the Moore's Law graph, you can see that up until the turn of the century, the number of transistors on a chip has been increasing commensurately with the clock speed. However, post that period, clock speed started to tailor off while we still got an increase in transistors. So we have to rely on multiple cores and CPUs, which means that we have to write concurrent code. Now, the thing about it is, writing concurrent code is hard. As you all know, it may be easy to spawn a thread. It's much, much difficult to write thread safe stuff. For example, you can end up with race conditions where two threads try to modify shared state. And that often leads to non-deterministic state, or better known in technical parlance as, how the hell did that happen? Uh, we can end up with thread starvation, where one or two threads hog the entire process. And even if we use low-level constructs like locks, mutexes, monitors, we still can end up with deadlocks or live locks. At the very least, we're guaranteed there's going to be some level of contention. And contention matters. We've known since the late 60s when Amdahl postulated his infamous law that even a small amount of contention can have a huge impact on throughput. If you look there, uh, let's say between 32 and 64, with even just 5% contention, if we were to double the number of processors, we'd only get a marginal increase in throughput. So, what can we do to help improve the situation? Okay, so let me recap there, make sure I've understood this problem. We have to respond to upwards of 20 billion requests per day, and we have to do that 
in milliseconds, I think 100 milliseconds is the typical response time required by um, our customers. And we have to do that modern CPU architectures, which are essentially multi-core, and distribute the workload across a massive number of servers. So from a software point of view, that means that we're going to have to write highly distributed and highly concurrent code. So one of the things that we've been looking at is uh, this notion of reactive programming and functional reactive programming to see if that can help us out. Because I think with traditional concurrency methods, this is how I imagine my highly concurrent Java code be written when I'm writing things using threads and synchronization and locks and all of that type of thing. But when I actually go and I build it and then I run it, it looks more like this. That instead of having the puppies uh, eating in parallel, they're all over the place, like getting each other's way and uh, uh, messing about. So when I write my application and it turns out like this, I have to spend a week or two weeks or three weeks or longer debugging the application, optimizing it, and finally at the end of that period, puppies are nicely back in parallel eating their dinner and everybody's happy. Job done. Come in on Monday morning, the product manager comes in to us and says he wants a new feature and changing the code and we're right back into this mess. It mightn't take too long to implement the feature, but certainly our experience has been that with traditional um, concurrency techniques is that we spend a lot of time optimizing and debugging and modifying the code base in that way. And this is a pretty inefficient way to develop software. It's not that you can't do it this way, it's just going to take you longer to do it and you're going to waste a lot of time working in this manner. So what's the cause of this? The cause is typically it boils down to shared mutable state that where once you make a variable mutable then you have to protect against risk conditions as Paul mentioned before and you protect against risk conditions by introducing synchronization and locks and that introduces other problems such as deadlocks and, and then you wind up you know when you begin to try and take that into account live locks and so on and so on. You just layer this complexity on top of complexity all because you introduce mutable state right at the very start. So is there any way that we can solve this problem and, and, and make this disappear and make our development cycle much, much easier? So I've already mentioned and the technical talk gives it away, what we've been looking at is reactive programming. So I don't know how, how many people would venture a definition of reactive. Um, I know from talking to people at a conversation maybe about a month ago with an engineer here in the company and uh, just in the middle of the conversation he just stopped me and he went away off to Google and then he came back having read what he found in Google and he said I don't think that's reactive programming like reactive programming is uh, forward a second it's, it's things like Vertex and Akka and Erlang and like certainly react reactive programming does encompass things like Vertex and Akka and Erlang but it's not limited to to those libraries and the reason why he got this impression was because when he googled it he wound up with this reactive manifesto. So the reactive manifesto itself is it's worth reading and um, but what it is is a series of worthy principles for building reactive systems. Things like your application should be responsive, you know, you should respond back to your users on time, it should be resilient to failure, it should be able to scale elastically and it should be message driven or event driven. They're worthy principles but they're pretty vague and, and that's maybe where the challenge then comes in in defining what reactive programming is because it does encompass things like ACA and Vertex but it also encompasses um, other libraries and frameworks and approaches, things like RxJava, or Pivotal Reactors, our own Cyclops React, and it's that area that we're going to talk about today, and functional reactive programming in particular, rather than just this general concept of reactive programming. So functional reactive programming, let's get into maybe a bit more in the details of that. This isn't something new, at least since back in 1997, a guy called Connell Elliott uh, released a paper on a package called Functional Reactive Animation Package, or FRAN for short, for the Haskell language. So, of course, releasing in the Haskell, it was wildly popular, and everybody in here has been using it every, ever since. Like, Haskell as a language is highly influential. It's massively influential, even though you may not realize it. Uh, so a lot of the features in Java 8 really have their, um, you know, their, their, their ultimate source of inspiration from languages like Haskell, but it's not wide, in wide mainstream use. So it really <laughs> took until the early 2000s, and this guy in the cool tie-dye t-shirt, which you know, always seems to have a big collection of these, came along and uh, came up with the reactive extensions spec or API at Microsoft. This is Eric Meyer. He was an architect, cloud architect at Microsoft back in the 2000s. Um, he came up with reactive extensions primarily on .NET, but they've spawned a whole host of 
related libraries in Rx JavaScript, Rx Java, and, and so on, and then a plethora of other libraries that are in turn inspired by the work that he did here. As an approach to programming, this is pretty well established in front-end development. It's particularly well su suited to, to building UIs and that type of thing, because UIs are essentially event-driven. You know, you're responding to user clicks and, and, and user actions in such a way. There's a pretty cool presentation out there that if you're interested in this thing, it's worth watching. This is uh, Bodil Stoke. Um, she is an engineer that lives in London um, that gives a lot of interesting talks and stuff. And this one, I grabbed a screenshot from and the, the picture of her. She gave a QCon back 2014, I think it's called What Every Hipster Needs to Know About Functional Reactive Programming. It's a pretty fun talk where she builds a game using this, I don't know quite what that animal is, <laughs> but I think it's somebody famous in some sort of cartoon or something like that. And she builds a game from scratch using Rx JavaScript over the course of the 40 minutes talk, and it's pretty cool as well, worth watching. But it's not just like on the you know the web front end, but things like I think React from Facebook is massively popular there. But also in Android with Rx Java, these techniques are very very popular and, and well established there as well. So now we know that it's not something that's not new, that uh, it's got a lot of different frameworks and options out there, and it's well established on the front end. Uh, maybe it's about time we actually started talking about the details of what it is. So one of the core components of functional reactive programming is functional programming. So I reckon if you go to a typical Java developer, typical imperative programmer, and you tell them they're going to do functional programming, you're going to scare the bejesus out of them. I don't think it has to be that way. Really what we're talking about is adopting best practices from functional programming, and really two in particular. One of which is a preference for immutable data structures and uh, objects and, and things like that. If you think back to what we think the cause here is when you're developing highly concurrent applications, it's this notion of shared mutable state and that you can avoid mutable state by uh, preferring immutable data types. The other one here is to prefer pure functions over uh, ones that aren't pure. So I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the concept of pure functions. So a yeah. pure, everybody is? Right, exactly. So if you uh, take a function for any given input x, you execute that function, you're guaranteed for that input x, you're always going to get output y, and it's not going to have a side effect, as Anik had said. It's not going to change any state at all external to that function. So it's kind of like you know an enclosed, uh, um, what's the word for that? Yeah, enclosed function that you can safely execute that's not going to launch nuclear missiles or something crazy. OK, so what do you get? if you adopt these uh, practices. So less buggy code, you've less mutable state, you've less moving parts. With uh, pure functions, they're inherently easier to test and to set up to test because you don't have a lot of outside state to worry about as well. With pure functions, they're much easier to optimize too because again, for any given input x, you're guaranteed to get output y. So once you call that function once, you see x, you get y. Well, you know that the next time you call it with x, you're going to get y again. So you can cache that x to y, you don't need to call the function again, and you can get that optimization pretty much for free if you're using pure functions. But really, the big, big benefit here to us is that they're much, much easier to parallelize. If you're using immutable data structures, you can share that information across threads safely without having to deal with the different contention and race conditions. And again, pure functions don't impact state outside of themselves, so it's much, much easier to distribute work um, across threads using pure functions than impure ones. So the other part of functional reactive programming is reactive programming. Now, I'll see how well I can remember my spiel about this. So what we're talking about here is essentially a, a declarative model where we define a pipeline, and each stage in the pipeline is made up of pure functions, and we push data through that pipeline. And so as data comes in, it gets pushed into one pure function, it gets transformed and pushed into another one, and so on and so on. So again, declarative, so we're telling the computer what to do, not how to do it. We let the pipeline itself or the implementation of the pipeline manage the, the, the details of how the things get executed. So let's take an example. So here, we want to change each element we receive by multiplying it by 100. We want to remove all elements after they've been multiplied up that are over 550. And then we want to print out each remaining element. So again, we're not telling the computer how to do this. We're just going to tell the computer this is what we want you to do. So the typical operator to do this, uh, the, the changing or the transformation in, in functional languages normally map. So map is a transformation operation. 
I don't know if you guys are familiar with the syntax, but this is Java 8 syntax. So what we have is a Java 8 Lambda expression that represents a function. It has a single input parameter E, and that will be a number, and we're going to multiply that by 100. So that's our first stage in our pipeline. To remove all the elements over 550, we use the filter operator. Again, we're passing in a Lambda expression with a single parameter, which will be the result of the previous stage, and we just check that that is less than 551 to, to determine whether or not to keep it in the pipeline. And then finally, on our last stage, we're just going to accept each element in, and we're going to print it out to the console if it's made it this far. So this is a concrete example using our Cyclops React library. This reactive seek or reactive sequence represents a sequence of values. In this case, we're passing in can values 6512, but there's no reason why that couldn't be something that comes from an asynchronous data source or you know any other source, essentially. But for, for purposes of example, we're just going to pass in a canned, canned data set of four values. Okay, so in our pipeline that we've defined in the previous uh, couple of slides, we have three stages. The first stage is our map or transformation stage. The second stage is our filtering stage. And the third and final stage, we're going to print stuff out to the console. So what happens is the data passes through the pipeline. First number in is 6. We In the map stage, it gets multiplied by 100. And it turns into 600 and gets pushed into the second stage, which is our filtering stage. 600 is greater than 551, so that's the end of 600. It's disappeared from the pipeline. We're going to drop it. Next up, 5 goes into our map or transformation stage. We multiply that by 100 to get 500. And then it goes into our filtering stage. It's less than 551, so we keep it in. And then it will go to the terminal stage where we print it out to the console, and we'll print out 500 to the console. And so on, 2 will come in, multiply by 100 to 200. It will stay in because it's less than 551, and we'll print it out. And something very similar will happen with 1 as well. So I'll hand you back over to Paul. So we've talked about functional reactive programming in the abstract, but let's deal with a more specific example. Forecasting is an extremely important part of our advertising systems. Advertisers need to know how many impressions are going to be served as part of their campaign. For example, they may choose targeting so restrictive that no impressions are served at all. Our optimization algorithms also make heavy use of forecasting. Remember, they've got to work out how much to bid and what type of ad to serve. The thing is with prediction, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the stock market or the weather, the best predictor of tomorrow's outcome is some function of today's. If it was snowing today, it'll probably snow tomorrow. Thing is, we have a huge amount of data that we can query, or historical data we can query, to work out how we should perform in the future. But this is petabytes of data, and we need to query it very, very, very quickly. We need to be as accurate as possible, and we can use some statistical techniques to reduce the data set, but if the data set isn't large enough, our results won't be accurate, and it won't be of any use. And we need to hit those SLAs very, very, very tightly. And this is what we produce, price volume curves. For all the different combinations of targeting that we have for our advertisers, we need to work out how much we should bid in order to garner a certain number of impressions. Just to remind you again of the numbers, the scale at which we're dealing with. We process about 20 billion bid requests on the display side. We serve about 2 billion ad records, which means we have 2 billion records that have information around viewability, clicks, actions, and all the successful targeting vectors. So in order to query huge amounts of data, we firstly need to index it. And this leads us with two key problems. One, we've got an I.O. problem where we have to stream in a huge amount of data in parallel. And secondly, we've got a computational problem. We've got to transform vast amounts of data very, very, very quickly. So can functional reactive programming techniques help here? OK, so let me su re-summarize this. Um, so we Get, we process around about 20 billion ad requests per day on the display side. It actually may be slightly more than that whenever you take into account impression records versus bid records, viewability records, and that type of thing. But we've got a huge volume of data that we need to process and index in some way. We also, on the other hand, receive a lot of queries in for these price volume curves and other types of forecasts, and we have to respond to those quickly, which means that we have to take this massive amount of data that's coming in convert it into some form that we can query it quickly against and that really is our, our indexing challenge. Algorithmically this is pretty straightforward, we're really talking about just taking in uh, raw log formats and converting it into some query, queryable data structure. But the big challenge here is the scale at which we have to operate. We have to process huge, huge volumes of this data streaming through our system.
So this is a potential algorithm that could solve this problem for us. I, I guess I mean, the main thing here is algorithmically it's pretty simple. We've the log records stored in S3 buckets in AWS or something similar to that. We read those in, we build our indexes, we push our indexes back out to the index store. The challenge here is the scale. We've got to distribute this work across cores on every server node that we use, and we've also got to distribute that, this work across multiple servers. And this is where the reactive programming part can come in and help us. So just to recap on our reactive pipeline, nothing much to say about this slide except for just to reintroduce it because we'll use it again and again. Okay, so one way that we could scale up our reactive pipeline is that we could distribute a single pipeline per each core. And this would be pretty efficient for computationally intensive tasks. So building the indexes is computationally intensive. We have all the data already in memory, we just want to convert it from one data structure, the raw data structure of our log formats, into a more structured, fast, queryable format. And this model of distributing a pipeline across each of the available cores is actually very efficient for doing that. It's much less efficient for the other stages where we have to stream in huge amounts of data from uh, remote data sources. And the reason for that is accessing data via I.O. is orders of magnitude slower than ac accessing data that's in a CPU's local cache or even in RAM. So that means that if we were to try this model of the pipeline per core, each core will be sitting idle for large periods of time as we wait for data to come in or, or, or responses to come back for, from these remote data stores. And that's then very, very inefficient use of the multi-core hardware that we have to make use of. So another alternative to distributing pipelines over cores would be to have a single pipeline and have it manage the distribution of tasks across cores instead. So that way, whenever a task is blocked and it's waiting for data to come back from a remote data source, we can simply swap that task out with another one and make more, more, much more efficient use of our cores when we're doing I.O. bound processing. So with the two models combined, we've got one that's very efficient for computationally intensive tasks and we've got one that's very efficient for I.O. bound tasks. And these, this slide maybe will give you an idea of the performance differences. That within our Cyclops React library, we have two different stream types that are optimized to solving both problems. Reactive Seek is primarily for computationally intensive tasks and single threaded, and it's useful for this if you want to distribute work acro uh, across cores on, on a pipeline per core basis. The future streams, on the other hand, take the other approach and they distribute the individual tasks across cores. So on the left hand side you can see the CPU relative performance for CPU bound tasks and you can see that um, future streams are much 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 slower for CPU bound computationally intensive tasks than reactive seek or reactive sequences. Whenever you go to IO bound tasks you can see that the reverse is true and that using these reactive sequences and leaving them you know, what's the word, hogging a core when they're not processing anything is really, really, really inefficient. You can, you can barely see the relative performance of the future stream there when it's doing I.O. tasks, but it, I mean, you can barely see the, the, the red line, but it's much, much, much more efficient at doing handling I.O. and large-scale I.O. Okay, so that's the theory. Um, let's, let's delve into a little bit of the code and see how that would look. So if you go back, or if you can cast your mind back to our example where we had a reactive sequence with 6, 5, 1, and 2, and so on, if we want to distribute that across cores, it's actually pretty simple. We have a future operations operator and we can pass in a Java executor service, and then that will get distributed onto one of the threads on, uh, on that executor service. So the executor service is it's basically a thread pool manager within Java. So that's what the code would look like if we want to do this uh, pipeline per core model. Um, if we want to do async I.O., we'll need to introduce something to manage tasks. So a data type within our Cyclops React library for managing individual tasks is a future W. So that's basically a wrapper around computable future in Java. And it, it, you guys have seen futures in JavaScript or in Scala or languages like that. It's something very, very similar. Difference between this pipeline, and you notice the operators are essentially the same. It's very, very similar to the Reactive Seek pipeline. And that's one of the nice things about this style of programming is that you can define your pipelines and then change your data type and get you know, different behavior based on the data type, but the, the programming model is ultimately very, very consistent. So how this difference is, differs from the reactive seek that we've seen on the previous one is that only, there's only a single data point within a future, and the future itself can execute asynchronously without blocking the current thread. So that's 
pretty good basis point for an individual task is to have some sort of future task, manage it, that you can then say, okay, you go and do that uh, on a different thread or on a different core, and then come, come back and let me know when you're finished. But what we'd like to do is manage lots of these. So this is where the concept of a future stream comes into play. So this is what our uh, future stream builder looks like, and the new Lazy React constructor, we're telling it that you can have 100 active future tasks at any given point in time. But I guess the key point here is that it's essentially the same as it is for the reactive sequence, as it is for the future. The code is pretty much the same, but you're getting this model that's totally different under the hood instead. We're getting the, the different future tasks distributed across cores and managed by the pipeline itself with the same coding model on the front end for engineers to work with. Nice thing about this is no low-level concurrency constructs at all that engineers have to deal with. It's all managed and hidden from them in under the framework. And in fact, this is all weight-free in under the framework. There's no synchronization or, or locks at all under the hood. Okay, so brief recap on our algorithm. We want to read data in from the log store, which is an I.O. bound task. We want to build our indexes, which is computational computationally bound task. And then we want to write those back out to a, an I.O. store via an I.O. bound or I.O. intensive process. So an architecture for doing that might be that we can stream data in in parallel from our AWS S3 buckets using future streams. We can then have them distribute those works, distribute the data as it comes in into various queues. So the queues are there to shard the data really. For a computational bound task, computationally bound task to build an index, we can have a reactive seek per core, and they can read off their own queue. So one of the jobs of the future stream there should be to shard the data in such a way that each reactive seek can execute it totally independently of each other. So in that way, there's no contention at all. They're just dominating that core once the data is in there, building the indexes, pushing the data back out to a queue on the other side where we have another future stream reading from it, and it can then take those built indexes and push them out in parallel very, very efficiently out into an AWS data store. So in this model, you have like highly efficient streaming of data in, highly efficient conversion of data across multiple cores, and then highly efficient streaming of data back out to a, to a remote source such as AWS. And I guess the really nice thing out of this is that you've got no level, no low level uh, Java concurrency primitives involved at all, and you've got a nice consistent programming model. So as I said, there's no messy threading code involved in this, and you have like a nice consistent model of everything essentially being a stream. And again, we've totally avoided having to do this, uh, you know, low-level uh, Java synchronization and locks and stuff like that that introduces enormous complexity into typical Java programs. So I guess if you, maybe some takeaways here. If you want to take this model further, there was a paper by Google maybe five or six years ago called Flume Java, where they described the technique, something very similar to what we've discussed today, whereby you could define a stream, and then that stream could execute in a single-threaded mode on your local machine, or the same stream as defined could execute in parallel on your local machine, or even the same stream as defined could be distributed across multiple nodes and executed in parallel there. If that sounds familiar, that is the basis of uh, libraries such as Apache Spark, which is also something that we use in our forecasting system to pre-process the data too. Yeah, so this was a talk that we gave at the launched I.O. summit in uh, the RDS in Dublin last, I think maybe two weeks ago. Um, it's kind of like an introductory, an introduction to how we're using functional reactive programming within our forecasting system in AOL. I hope you guys uh, found this useful, and I guess if you have any questions, myself and Paul would be more than happy to answer them now. So, so one of the criticisms of this approach has been that you use stack trace to get exceptions, and then it becomes very hard to be work what exactly caused the exception because the, the stack trace is basically what you get as stack trace is maybe some executor invoking a thread and you get an exception. You don't really get a trace of what stages were before that an executing this will cause the exception. I'm just curious to know if there's a solution that you could you, you run into or you found. So in so yeah. So the question is that uh, a criticism of this approach is that it can be difficult to debug because you lose some information in, in, in the stack trace when an error occurs because it's uh, it's uh, it's distributed across threads. So I guess my first question would be: Is that any different though? If you have to build a highly concurrent application, 
do you still have the same problem because the work is distributed across uh, threads anyway? Or, and also I guess maybe the other question would be, um, at which stage do you see this being the biggest problem? I imagine it's probably where you're using the future streams. Yeah, most likely you would see problems with IO bound. Right. Bound. Yeah. So I guess like that logic should be pretty simple. I mean, you shouldn't be loading it with a lot of complicated business logic at that point. You're really just using it to, to, to distribute the work of streaming the data in. And then once you have that in, if you distribute it across uh, into queues so that you can then just read from that queue, your business logic should be in the computationally bound section. And I think there it, it's, it's much easier to debug because you can see the flow through and step through it in, a, in an easier fashion. Um, I guess like that's the way we operate under it. I don't know if that helps. Uh, the CPU bound stream is able to preserve the stack. Right. The yeah, the whole business logic's in one place. Yeah. yeah. So by, by isolating out the I/O bound parts and CPU bound parts, um, it's probably easier to debug than if you were using a system that didn't give you that kind of uh, encapsulation. Well, thanks very much.